Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for all your blessings, for the fellowship that we can experience. Through thy Holy Spirit, we ask that you can unite our hearts and minds together on this Sabbath, that your people can be united in word and in deed. And we just ask, Lord, that as we open your word together this evening, that you can help us to see things clearly. You know our need of you. And you know the needs for each person and the struggles they face. We ask that you can comfort us, that your angels can watch over us, and that you can lead us into a deeper relationship with you. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Well, happy Sabbath to everyone and good evening. Now, this study, and I always kind of apologize a little bit, and even with the Hebrew study, doing a study once a week or once every two weeks, like the Hebrew study is, I find quite difficult, you know, to go back, I, I watch a little bit of the video, try to get a continuity of, of thought, but there's always some loose threads that I fail to pick up. Um, when we when we come to the study again now we had been studying so just to try to review some of this a little bit in this study of the sanctuary i've tried to follow the main thread has to do with the promise of genesis chapter three that's the seed of the woman and that the history of the story of the bible is is a story about christ tied to that is the origin of sin and Christ as the promised seed that he would um, bruise his heel when he bruises the head of the serpent. There was lots of different things that we looked at at the beginning. He's this imagery, this idea, these ideas that come to play later on, especially in relationship to the sanctuary itself. That is, the sanctuary doesn't just pop up out of nowhere, and yet it continues to develop and grow as God's plan of salvation is being unfolded to mankind. And one of the things that we saw is that man separated himself from God when he sinned, and that the sanctuary is showing the pathway back to God, how we can approach God. Now, we have a contrast here. And that contrast that we're going to see in Exodus chapter 32 has to do with the false worship, the golden calf. And this goes back to the Ten Commandments, where God says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven Im a graven image or any likeness of anything which is in heaven above or in the waters uh, or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth, and thou shalt not bow down th thyself to them nor serve them, for I, am the, I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the um, fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. I think that's uh, roughly a quote if, uh, you know, of the second commandment. So there it is, Exodus 20, verse three to um to six so so this idea then that they're going to worship this golden calf where does it come from like why are they worshiping a golden calf so we're going to look at that and um the other thing that that dwight studies are addressing is in chapter 19, when they make the covenant with God, this is before they hear the Ten Commandments spoken from Mount Sinai, which is a really important. And, and Dwight is suggesting that that covenant is Leviticus 25 and 26, to some degree, at least. That. Um, so now when we go to Exodus 32. Excuse me. I'm not, yes. suggest, I'm not suggesting it. This is what 
I am finding both from what Mrs. White has written and also from what the original translators of the Bible are recommending. Yeah, I know. I just always use this soft language. I mean, I'm all I'm trying to say is that I'm not putting myself as some great expert. I'm okay. just noting. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you're showing. How's that? It has been revealed in my study. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's been revealed in Dwight's study that this is the case. And, 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 it, and it makes a lot of sense because we know that the Ten Commandments aren't spoken until after they make this covenant, that they have the blood sprinkled upon them and so forth. And they say, all the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. That isn't the Ten Commandments that they're responding to because the Ten Commandments haven't been spoken yet. So, so it's kind of a bit of an interesting puzzle that we're sorting through right now and how this, this covenant obviously relates to the sanctuary uh, because we know that Christ as our high priest, he's also going to be the sacrifice and that he's going to die in the midst of the week when he's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. And that confirming of the covenant come from, comes from Genesis 15 when um Abram is told to cut those animals in half, um, the, the turtle dove, the young pigeon, uh, the lamb, the, the goat, and, and the bullock, right, which are the sanctuary animals. Uh, so, so there's a whole bunch of things that we've looked at, all these little threads, and sometimes we have to keep those things in our minds as we continue studying this sanctuary that is, there's lots of little ideas that we can't ignore, we can't forget about. So when it comes to this golden calf, this is when Moses is going up into the mountain to receive the 10 commandments, that this rebellion is going to occur. And Moses is there for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Now, this to me is kind of bizarre. I mean, but, but we, we can look at this and we can kind of say, what are they doing? But are we any different? No. No, we think because we, delayed, delayed of some kind of some, you know. Right. So when we look at a delay, I mean, this is the impatience of man. God has a purpose and a plan that we're not aware of. And when things don't meet our expectations, we then act rashly. We try, to, we try to accomplish what we think God's plan is. We, we saw this even with Abraham. I mean, God gives him a promise. And at the suggestion of his wife, you know, he takes Hagar and has a child with Hagar. But that doesn't accomplish God's plan. Okay. That, as a question. Mm -hmm. How long had occurred in the time frame when God explained to Abram that he was going to make a great nation of him and his wife giving the recommendation to take Hagar as a wife to fulfill God's word. Well, um, from his initial promise, are you talking about from Genesis 15? Let's say from Genesis 15. Yeah, so, so maybe it's about 10 years. I was thinking about 11. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's 10 or 11 years. We're not sure exactly when Genesis 15 happens. We kind of have to infer it. But, but yeah, so it's about 10 years. And of course, his, you know, his wife is, is pretty old. So in order for this promise to be fulfilled, 
you know, he tries to solve this with, um, you know, in his way. Okay. So, bringing up. Yeah. so the, the point that I'm getting at is that at that time, Abram was about 75 years old, right? Yeah. And 11 years later, he would make, be roughly 86, which would mean his wife would have been 76. Yeah. So in the mind of man, God is taking too long. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Now, how long, given the, the, the passage that we're going into right now, from the time that Moses led the children of Israel to this area where Moses is receiving the covenant, the commandments, and everything else. Yeah. How long had taken place here? From the time yeah. when to when? If you were if you were to look at uh, Exodus 19. Yeah. That's in the third month. Okay. The third month of what, though? Well, the third month of the first year that they came out of Egypt. Okay. So, so in other words, we're in the third month. We know that while they were going through all of this in Egypt, that God had appointed that part of the year as the first month unto them, right? Yeah. So we're talking about the third month of the year. And the, the passage that you are referring to is taking place somewhere between the third month and the fourth month. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, maybe 90 to 120 days or something. Um, well, even less than that, I guess. Yeah, so third month would be like six. Well, so the first month, the 15th day of the first month, they left. So right. like two months later, so two to three months later, when this rebellion occurs, so about three months later. Okay, now, just like what you're, <clears throat> the way that, this portion of, of the um, ESORT is showing, we're looking at the month of Ab, right? Um, yeah, they say here that it's in Ab, but I think it would probably be the month of Tammuz. It could be the month of Ab. Could easily be Tammuz. Yeah. Because how long was Moses on the mount? 40 days and 40 nights, plus one week before. Um, and if they got there on the 15th, it could be in, in the month of Ab. Okay. But, but somewhere near the end of Tammuz in the beginning of Ab. So my point is we are not dealing with a period of years. We're dealing with at the maximum what we would say to be a month and a half. Yeah. And during this entire time, what else is going on around them? Well, not much. Doesn't it say that the glory of God is on was, the mount? Yes. Yeah. So I guess that, but I mean, as far as anything else, I mean, they're not being attacked by enemies or anything like that. So I would say the enemies were afraid to come near them. Yeah. So, so they should have been worshiping God. They should see what's happening. Um, they should be in a completely different state of mind. Than exactly. what they, that is, they could see that God has been leading them and that he's still leading them. And, and just because what they expected didn't happen on July 18th, 2020, doesn't mean that they should have um, been rash and, and try to find out some other solution. So is this situation from Exodus 32, the children of Israel's July 18th? Well, I think in some ways it is, at least it's a parallel in the sense of how people are acting, whether exactly. it was on a line that way, I'm not certain, but it, there, there is some parallels. Well, here they have, they have come to an area 
God has led them. They've said to the words that Moses brought back, all you have said, this we will do. Mm -hmm. And that at the maximum has taken place, say, 46 days before this situation with the golden calf. Yeah. So in 46 days, they're setting aside their own word. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing what they have said they will do, they now want to go back into slavery. Right. And the golden calf represents what? What if the golden calf is representing reliance upon man? Yeah. Because that's what they knew. Okay. Yeah. So there's a comment in the chat from Angela here. Uh, she says, in time of respite from external threats, they terribly backslid. Delay is meant to test our faith or perseverance with an exclamation mark. So good comment there. I also commented on on the bull god. Yeah, they were referring. I think, to the, and you know what struck me too? It says make us gods. So I looked up gods in my in my concordance, and the same word for god is is the same word for gods. Yeah, it's just Elohim. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no difference um, because the word god is in the plural. Yeah, in the Bible. Elohim. So. The eem at the end is the pluralization. Right. The god is, is in a plural form. And so the gods, whether you say gods or God, there is no difference in Hebrew. It's just so absurd that they were trying to create a creator. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. It's, it's the same. Well, yeah. So, so this idea, of course, we know that, that this does go back somewhere like the idea that they're going to make a golden calf is is a worship from the past something to do with egypt but also something to do with with a belief in somehow that a cow represents god which doesn't really make much sense and especially since um they they have heard the ten commandments spoken from mount sinai that they're not supposed to do this. And so, but they're still going to do it. So one is they're kind of denying that God has led them, that Moses somehow has misled them, that they're going to go back to something that they had before, right? They're going to go back to the Seventh-day Adventist church or some kind of belief system that they had before. And and then Aaron, who is their, their leader in the place of Moses here, he doesn't fight against it, which I find interesting. And, and so Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. You know, and so I'm always very fascinated that Aaron just goes along with this. I mean, what does this mean that Aaron would do this? Well, okay. Aaron would look to be a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. And if we were to look at this in another, in another manner, what Aaron is doing is he's giving a peace and safety message. Yeah. Rather than supporting the message of July 18th, he is wanting to turn around and say, this is a man, we need to rely upon man rather than relying upon God. Well, but yeah, I don't know. It, it, to me, the whole story, when I read it, it just doesn't make much sense. But I'm saying it's easy to look at this story and say, this is what they did and, and why did they do it? But we do the same things. Well, 
let's uh, I look at I look at a situation that I'm very familiar with from my area. Mm-hmm. We had a couple that was was very vocal, very upfront on presenting the message of the seven times. Yeah. They bring another another group into into this because well, quote, they're just like us. They believe this message of the seven times. Well, the mm-hmm. problem that we have right now is neither the original couple nor this group that they brought in have chosen to go forward. I mean, the, the couple have now decided that, hey, we do not have salvation outside of the corporate church. Therefore, we are going to agree to abandon everything that we have been presenting. We are going to agree not to present this any further, period, so that we can be restored to fellowship within the corporate church. Why is that so painful? But the thing is, yeah. Now, the thing is, it's easy to see this in someone else, right? So, So I understand, you know, we can see this happening. I mean, ever since I've been an Adventist, I've always been surprised at people who all sudden, suddenly who were very earnest Adventists, deep studiers, and the next thing you know, they're in the world. And I would always be amazed at this. Um, but yet, are we any different? You know, are we, are we any more safe than they are and human nature is what it is our nature is what it is and and many people have thought that they're not going to fall off the path but they fall off the path and so you know so here you have a warning to us not just about what we have seen happen with other people but what could happen with us and so we need to learn the lessons from this just in a, in a practical sense. Now, you know, and it's easy to say that, you know, Aaron is a people pleaser. I mean, I'm a people pleaser too. You know, my nature is anyway. I don't like people being unhappy. And I, I try to, you know, see other people's sides. And sometimes I can be a bit weak um, when I shouldn't be. But, you know, I've tried to learn from what I've seen in the scriptures that sometimes you, you have to make a stand and, and it's not always what we think. Sometimes we think we're making a stand for the truth, but all we are involved in is a party spirit. You know, like we in this group, we can think, well, we're making a stand against the church, but when things arise within our own movement, are we going to be so bold to make a stand, right? Aaron could stand against the Egyptians, but when it came amongst his own people and you have people calling for something, he becomes weakened. He, he, he goes with the crowd. Now, Aaron probably in his mind is imagining that he's trying to appease them in some way. Right. I mean, I don't know what Aaron's really thinking. I mean, I can only, from what I read in the spirit of prophecy in the Bible, that, that he's weak in this way, but he's, he's also deceiving himself. And he also tries to deceive Moses, you know, because later you're going to see that he just says, well, you know, they gave me these golds and up came this golden calf as if it just happened miraculously. But in verse four, it says, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a golden calf and the, and they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And so you can see they're mixing this. They're saying that this is, so they're connecting which, what has happened with these false gods that they made this molten calf. So this be, and it says thy gods, but it really means the, this be thy God which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And yet they've just had the 10 commandments spoken to them a short time before saying, thou shalt not make a graven image. 
So, and then when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, go get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them, and they have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto. And said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So there's a number of things here, um, which you know I'm, gonna, I'm not going to look at every little detail. But one thing that we can see, what is God doing with Moses? Why is God, what's that? Testing him. He's testing him, right? So why is he testing him? What is this particular test? It's a test of character, test specifically of Moses' character. Okay, which aspect of Moses' character and why? Are you willing to be my shepherd and do what the chief shepherd has to say, or are you seeking to become the chief shepherd yourself? Right. And so in some ways, God is testing Moses, his response to the rebellion of others. And, and what is our response often to the rebellion of others? I mean, and, and I'm going to use this as an example, but this is the thing that, that struck me the most is after November 9th, well, particularly after September 7th, 2019, many people in this movement, what was their response to the rebellion that we saw with Parminder and Tess? What do you think, what was our general response in this movement, let's say, instead of trying to say specific people? Few stood up. Okay, so, um, but even when we're on the side of the truth, we stand by Jeff, what is our attitude about those that, that rebelled? Do we have the same attitude that Moses had? Well, Not personally, many. I felt disgust and resentment, and I was also angry with myself for having been de 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 deceived by them for a while. So you guys aren't understanding what I'm talking about. So basically, my view was that many of us were proud that we had not gone on the side of Parminder. That is, we didn't see... We didn't see that we were just like those people that followed Parminder. And, and I saw a lot of what I would call gloating, people gloating over this. And, and I, I didn't like it because I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was becoming, for one. But also, as we continued to study into July 18th, it was an us and them sort of attitude regarding those that had left, that we're somehow better. And the whole idea of July 18 for many people was to be a vindication that we were right and they were wrong. And to me, that, that would indicate that we weren't prepared for what would have happened if July 18th had occurred as we predicted. But as if it had occurred, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have been able to, to represent God correctly in his character. And we would have been crushed by the negative response that we would have received. That is, and we were, and many people were crushed the fact that it didn't occur. But if it had occurred, I think it would have been worse. People would, people would have thought that they would have been receiving vindication, but they would have actually been more reviled if July 18th had occurred. 
And why is that? Why would we have been more reviled if July 18th had occurred? I'd be thinking we had something to do with it. You know, there have been all kinds of misrepresentations in the media regarding this movement that people would not be able to handle. The whole world would have turned against us. It would not have been pleasant. And yet people thought it would have been a vindication. And I don't think it would have been in the eyes of the people that we wanted to be vindicated of. Right? So in this situation, Moses has a heart of Christ. He is not concerned for himself. He is concerned for these people, and God is testing him and demonstrating to Moses himself something that he needs to see. So it says, um, and Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power? And with a mighty hand. Um, so, so we can see that Moses isn't describing himself as the one who brought them out of Egypt. It's God who did. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So to me, this is an amazing story. Now, what is Moses saying? Um, What is his appeal? What is he appealing to in God? Well, he's as asking for mercy from a God that keeps his promises and really wants the best for us. Okay. Um, so, so God has made, he's, he's, he's saying that you have, you have to keep your word. You made this promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You swear by your own self. And so you can't turn away from your promise. So, so what is Moses appealing to? What, what's happening here? What's the dynamic? Because, I mean, God is not going to, to slay them because he is going to keep his promise. He doesn't, and it says the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. I mean, this is just a human expression to try to explain this. So he, he obviously isn't going to do this. And I don't think he would have done it. But what is the dynamic here? Explain what you mean by dynamic. Okay. What is actually happening between God and Moses? What is, what is this exchange about? What are they illustrating? And why is it being illustrated? Because we've, we already touched on a little bit when we just started the study. Because it's going to the promise that God made to, to Abraham when he bought, brought him out of Haran, right? Correct. He made this covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Isaac. He made a covenant with Jacob. And in this, 
Moses sees something that God wants him to see. So God is testing Moses, that's true, but he's also teaching him something. And this all relates to everything that we're studying from Exodus 19 all the way to this golden calf. There's a lesson being learned that's being illustrated here in this exchange between Moses and God. And what is it that's being illustrated? Man's need to trust the word of God. Okay. So, but God, God is the one who's made these promises. And man, and, and man has tried to fulfill those promises. He's tried in his own strength. Okay. So what does this have to do with the covenant? Rather than relying upon the words that were presented of the covenant itself, that God is going to be capable of seeing that we can keep the covenant, we're saying that we need from our own character, from our own righteousness, to be able to keep this so that we are on an equal footing with God. So that's what people thought. They were on an equal footing with God. Correct. And. What Moses is, is focusing upon here is God's promise. God's word. He swore by his, his own self. Right? Thou swearest by thine own self. So God's character is at issue here. Is this the great controversy? In a nutshell. Yeah. So, so, you know, sometimes we can just pass by this really quickly and, you know, not really understand the importance of it. But as we place it in the context of the covenant, this covenant that is made, this covenant is based, based because this idea, you know, is you have sworn by thine own self. We know that in, in the book of Hebrews there, that by two immutable things, God swearing by himself and God speaking that that covenant is sure. That's the new and everlasting covenant. So the covenant where God swears by himself is not the old covenant. It's the everlasting covenant. The covenant that they make in Exodus 19, that covenant they break. That covenant can never stand. The covenant where we say, all the Lord has said we will do and be obedient can never stand because it's based upon man's promises and man's promises are faulty. But God's promises are not. In spite of what we see happening around us, God's promises are yea and amen. Correct? Yes, and this is, the, this is the problem that's being manifested here, is because they were trusting in their own righteousness, they failed. They never understood their nature. They never knew their God. He that says, I know God and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, John says in, in 1 John. So in order to keep God's commandments, they would have to know God. And this is an important point that's going to be seen as we go through this story. Because so, so for on the one hand, you have this covenant made. You're going to have the Ten Commandments spoken. You're going to have the sanctuary service being presented as a remedy for sin in type. And then you're going to have Moses go up onto Mount Sinai receive the Ten Commandments, and while he's receiving them, and God has these tables that he's prepared with his own hand and written with his own finger, while that's happening, God's people are in utter rebellion against him, against everything that they had promised and everything that God has revealed, and the law is going to stand as a witness against them. So, <clears throat> 
there's a whole bunch of things at issue here that we have to keep in mind. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf, which they had made, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel to drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not that anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me and I cast it into the fire. And there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, that Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Now there's a lot happening here. And I don't know if we could really unpackage this um, completely. <clears throat> so when um, so when Joshua and Moses are coming down, they hear this this sound. What is it that they're experiencing? What's going on? I mean, we know literally what's going on. What's 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 symbolically going on? Children of Israel accepting the mark of the beast. Yeah, okay. The rejection, the rejection of Christ. Yeah, so would this be the Sunday law? Easily. Okay. What would our be our basis for saying it's the Sunday law? Uh, Worship in a counterfeit. Yeah. Because yeah. we could look at this as the parallel with... Uh, Daniel and Daniel's three friends in um, the plains of Jura with the image of, of the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. We, we could look at it that way. We have this beast and his image. It's the image of the beast, this calf. Any other ideas about this? Well, if the children of Israel without the tribe of Levi were celebrating naked, mm -hmm. then they're basically saying that they did not want the righteousness of Christ. Okay, so it's a rejection of the righteousness of Christ. Correct. 
And, and this is God's people. God's people are going to reject God and worship the image of the beast. So isn't this a, isn't this a foreshadowing of 1888? Well, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, 1880, 1888 is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen as well. So, so this is all a foreshadowing of what's going to happen at the end of the world. It's a type of it. But man is going to reject God's people, end up rejecting God and go into idolatry. It, it happens again and again in the history of Israel. But this is the first time it happens. Now, of course, Moses is going to break the Ten Commandments. And that's symbolic of the fact that the covenant that they had made is null and void. How is this the first time that this happens? Well, it's the first time that it happens in this way. We don't have them making a golden calf. We do have them. I mean, we have the rebellion of Baal Peor and we have other things like that uh, later on. No, I'm, I'm going back to Eden. Okay. Well, I, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, uh, but in Eden, Adam and Eve don't make a golden calf. I'm just saying that they go into this type of idolatry. Right. But what they also did is they rejected the righteousness of Christ because they didn't want to take him at his word. Right. So, yeah. So with Eve at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's the beginning of sin. But it's... Right. Yeah, so I understand that. I'm just saying it's manifest now in full-blown idolatry. Had they not been in idolatry prior to God delivering them out of Egypt? Yeah, but they were in captivity, and they had just forgotten over time. That wasn't open rebellion against something that, that they knew and understood. But right. Nevertheless, they were in the habit of doing it. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where they get idolatry from, is from being slaves in Egypt. Wouldn't would, 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 um, the Pharaoh, when he um, forced them to work on the Sabbath, wouldn't that have been a son to law? <coughs> Very well, possibly. In a sense, but they're in captivity, right? They're not in a reform line. Right. During that time, it's it's the four generations, which is a progressive destruction of four. So something happens there that they go into darkness. Right. That four generations symbolizes the same thing, this progressive destruction of four in after a reform line, because you can look at the story of Joseph as a reform line. And then you have these four generations. And in the fourth generation, they're in a period of darkness. And so they're called out of darkness in this reform line. But in this reform line, they're going to have a Sunday law. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. So, yeah, they, they obviously were in, in darkness during that time when Moses comes and calls them out of Egypt. But the first time that they're actually going to try to keep the Sabbath while they're slaves there, um, you know, Pharaoh makes them work harder, right? So there's this, this whole struggle that's going on. But now they're, they're out of Egypt. They've been in a reform line. God has led them. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're now making this covenant with God. And now they're in what we would call open rebellion. I don't think them in the past being in slavery and being exposed to idolatry is open rebellion in that sense. That's, that's all I'm saying. 
So this is the first time we see this in this manifestation. But it's going to happen throughout the history of the children of Israel, that they're going to go and worship these golden calves. We're going to see it uh, with Jeroboam, right? He's going to make two golden calves. But the question is, where does this come from? And, and we can go back to the Garden of Eden. We can see that in sort of in type, but not in, you know, Eve doesn't create a golden image. She doesn't create, create a gold, you know, a golden calf. So um, what Angela says there regarding um, the counterfeit sanctuary animal. Where, where, where does this come from? Because this is a counterfeit. That's, the, I, I think, the point that, that we need to see. I guess the question I'm asking is, why was this attractive to the children of Israel? Let's, let's answer that question first. Why is this attractive? Well, some of it was a custom. It was a custom they had in Egypt. Okay, well, it's a custom, customer, customer tradition, or that they picked up in Egypt. But but they were slaves in Egypt, and now and now they're they've been delivered from Egyptian bondage, and 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 you know they don't have the forty years in the wilderness yet, so all they've had is God leading them, you know, miracle after miracle. Complaining after complaining. Yeah. Okay. So complaining after complaining for some reason. Um, and yet God but, keeps delivering them. Not just for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay, let's, let, let's be clear. We have the children of Israel here, but there's another group that's part of them. The mixed multitude. Right. Now, why were they called the mixed multitude? Well, there was lots of them, and they were mixed. Because the children of Israel had chosen to marry Egyptian wives. Okay. So they have, uh, they have uh, Egyptian wives that are connecting them to uh, idolatry. Families as well, probably. Correct. Okay. So the mixed, the mixed multitude were the first of the complainers. They were the first to say we don't know what's going on here and the people chose to listen to this yeah okay and that's a good point so so they're listening to to others you know i, I mean it's like being in a classroom how many children does it take to make to disrupt the classroom just one. This takes one. One, one child in a classroom can cause that whole classroom to be disordered. The influence of these negative people, of these people who have this spirit in them, is extremely powerful. And, and the question is, why would this be attractive to them? Like the idea that we're going to make these calves... I mean, we obviously it wouldn't be attractive to us. So we would have to try to parallel what it is that they found attractive about this idea, why they would even hearken to the mixed multitude. Well, okay. Let's compare this with Uriah Smith and his use of other commentators from about 1858 through 1863. So it appeals to human nature on some level. Yes. But the question is what? Because we are facing the same thing all the time. And we have to figure out what it is that, that is our danger, right? Because I'm always trying to bring this close to home for us to examine our own hearts, for me to examine my own heart. What is it 
that I can't see because they couldn't see where they were, where, where they were headed. It made sense to them. Okay. October 22nd, 1844. Yeah. Did that make sense to the majority of the world? No. So after October 22nd, 1844, what happened to the majority of the Millerites? Well, they all fell away. Save how many? 50. Okay. So we went from a multitude to a, a fairly great remnant. As in one of the smallest remnants that you could have. Yeah. And the number 50, of course, is in, important to us because this is Pentecost, but it is also seven times seven weeks plus one day. Yeah. Now, it was not because of the wisdom of man. These 50 chose to say, we will rely upon God and let God show us what we are to do. And they went and they studied, right? Yeah. So when we're bringing this close to home, we cannot afford to hold on to the wisdom of man. We have to set aside what we believe to be our, our wisdom and let God lead us. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that I have, and the thing that at point I'm trying to make, is that we don't realize that we're trusting in the wisdom of man. When we're doing this, when you're in rebellion, you actually think you're not in rebellion. Would we agree with that? I'm not, um, not all the time, because some people say, well, I don't want to have a thing with God because God has failed me. They're not realizing they didn't live up to what they should have lived up to and just kept kept on, on trusting, even though everything seemed bleak and black around them. You know, like I, I've gone through that phase too. Well, God didn't do what I wanted him to do. Therefore, I'm going to do it on my, in my own strength, in my own way, until I hit a brick wall again, you know. So, so, so we can look at a situation. You know, we have July 18th. We can look at this and we can see the people who are in this movement, people that we loved and cared for, stood up against the truth when things didn't happen the way that they expected. And they tried to make out, at least they tried to make out, that they were the ones in the right and that anybody who opposed them was in the wrong. But they were in open rebellion against God. They were saying, God didn't lead us. Right? That we're, we're just really? following. They just said, we're following man. This was, this July 18th was of man. Which it couldn't have been. It had to have been of God. Because it wasn't something that man could have orchestrated or could have designed. But, but we can look back in that and say, well, those people... They obviously were in rebellion against God. But the thing is, do we understand our own situation? Do we? Now, I understand we need to study. There, that's, that's a given. And, and we haven't studied like we should. But there's something else. It's, it's how people study. Now, you know, maybe this is me just looking at things from my perspective, and maybe I'm wrong. But I think. That when we get caught up and we take pretty much the same view that worldly people have about what's happening around us today, we have to start to wonder what our message is. When our message, what, when you can find on Facebook people saying everything that this movement is saying, that it's talking about, what, how different are we from the world? Isn't our message a different message? That is, we can look at what's happening. Everybody can look at what's happening right now. They can look at the pandemic. They can look at the vaccine mandates. And they can say the same thing that we are saying. So is our message any different? 
And what is it there about that message that appeals to our human nature? Because when we have a message that appeals to our human nature, then it's not a true message. The truth always is contrary to human nature. I'm saying that we can be in open rebellion against God and believe we're doing the right thing. At least trying to make ourselves believe we're doing the right thing. So when we have this disappointment, and this disappointment, I would say Moses delaying to come down from the mount is a disappointment for the Israelites, at least in this illustration. They're now going to decide what their message is, but it's not the message that God has given them. And this movement is at a crossroads right now. We have to find out what our message is. And what I see right now, from my human perspective at least, is I see that we don't know what our message is, and that most people in this movement aren't even is interested in our message. They're interested in a message that appeals to them. It appeals to their human nature. And it has to do with how we study. Because we can study where we're puffed up, where we, where we exalt ourselves, where we think of ourselves as better than others, where we compare ourselves to others. And we think we're better than they are. But when you study God's word, it doesn't do that to you. Human, human glory is trampled in the dust. And this is what I think God is teaching Moses. Because he's giving him a test. And this test is, is he going to trust in God, God's promises? And Moses is. He's not going to say, you know, I led, I led them here and now you're making me look bad. Does, does Moses say that? Never. You're going to destroy my reputation. No, your reputation is at stake. And that's whose reputation is at stake now. And God is expecting us to be on his side. Not on the world's side, not to be political, not to be angry, not to be frightened. If we're, we're going to have anger, it has to be the type of anger Moses had. Because Moses' anger was for God's, God's sake. Because it was God's reputation that was being hurt. Not Moses' reputation. It was God's character that was being drugged in the mud. Yeah. And that's what he was angry for. This was true righteous indignation. Because it wasn't about his feelings and who he was it was about god's character and reputation being dragged in the mud and that's what the israelites were doing and so so he appeals to god's character to god's promises and this is what we have to do now then moses is going to grind up this calf now it's kind of weird you know because it's a molten calf but he burns it in the fire. So he must somehow uh, take this and thin it out, put it into to sheets, grind it into powder and, and put it in the water and make the children of Israel drink of it. Now, does anybody know what happens when you take gold and you turn it into powder and you mix it with water? Uh, no. Have you never been gold mining before 
Well, I never have. Have you? Yeah. Okay. So well, what well, happened? Basically, you know, you start looking and, you, and you're finding little flakes of gold in water. Yeah. Because gold is heavier than the water. Mm -hmm. So what Moses is doing here, this was, this was, yes, it was molten at one time yeah. when they cast it, but mm -hmm. it was no longer molten when he got a hold of it. He just, it, it was one of these things that we're going to grind this down. We're going to get rid of this visible symbol and we're going to make the people partake of their golden God. Right. So it's no longer there as the symbol of a leader. It is now a consumable. Mm -hmm. So you're going to suspend this gold in water, in dust. And then they're going to drink it. And so the God that they worship, they're now going to eat, right? So I think that's just what I said. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just repeating it. <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and, and in one of the commentaries, it talks about how they would have done this, which, which I've read other places. Basically, they'd have to make it into gold leaf and then, and then grind it somehow. So I'm not sure um, how much of the calf they did this with. I'm not, not certain. I mean, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details and how I'm long... I believe they would have had to do the whole thing. Yeah, I would think they probably would have, but you would have had to have a lot of people do this. I mean, Moses couldn't have done this by himself. He probably had help from some of the tribe of Levi. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, now, we know Aaron's, of course, excuse, which is pretty obvious. Um, and pretty lame. <laughs> yeah. It, it's sort of similar to uh, Saul's um, excuse when he didn't kill uh, the Amalekites. Um, so the children of Levi then are going to stand. Now, now Moses, of course, didn't want gods to, do, to erase all of the children of Israel. But Moses is now going to enact this slaughter. Now, why are they doing this? I mean, Moses wanted God to show mercy, but now Moses doesn't appear to be showing mercy. They gave him a choice. Was it on God's side? Come over here. Right. So, so everybody... Choice, they, they, their choice was to get slaughtered, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, so they had a choice. Yep. Right. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. So everybody could have been on the Lord's side. Yeah. But it says, all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, thus that the Lord God of Israel put every man his sword in his side and go in and out from the gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And so, I mean, they're going to kill about 3000 men, which is quite a few. Um, this would be worse than our pandemic percentage wise. Um, and it came to pass on the moral that Moses said unto people, you have sinned a great sin. Now it will go up unto the Lord peradventure. I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. So what is Moses saying here? A type of Christ. Well, he's a type of Christ, isn't he? So yeah. if he's going to have his name blot, blotted out of the book which God has written, what is he asking? Because what is this book that he wants, he says, blot my name out of this book?
It's the book of life. That's the book of life. So he's saying, I will give up my eternal life for these people. So again, Moses is not concerned about himself. And he understands this sin, how terrible it is. Now, I think in some ways, when we go back to the slaughter, this is in some ways just in sort of this gross expression, basically to appease God's wrath, that there needs to be consequences for what has happened. But yet he knows that that's not enough, that this doesn't forgive the sin. And so he goes to God and appeals to God to forgive them. Forgive them for they do not know what they do. This would be similar to Christ on the cross. Now the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. So we're also going to have a plague that's going to happen because of this. Now, why does God do this? Even though he's going to forgive them to some degree, right? There's still going to be consequences. Why does God do that? Well, so they learned their lesson. Okay. If there weren't consequences for what we do, it was just forgiven and everything put back to a perfect condition before it was, what would keep us from just doing the same thing and, and even worse things? Okay. Now, it's not just that God is, is using this as a deterrent. That is, God doesn't punish because so that we are fearful of punishment. God wants to see that there is a consequence to our actions. Remember when David committed murder and adultery. He wanted the son to live, but the son died. There was consequences for David's actions. The things that he did affected his kingdom. God doesn't remove the consequences of sin when he forgives us. At least not in their temporal sense. When we sin, we receive the consequences of those sins. And if God didn't allow us to have the consequences of those sins, he couldn't really save us. You know, there are people out there who think that what God should do is just make it so that anything we do, any action we take, always turns out to be good. I mean, it's kind of a silly, childish idea. But they don't want to have consequences. But that's not realistic. When Adam and Eve sinned, there were consequences. God could not just forgive them and have everything go back to where it was. They started down a path that that they had to continue to follow, that mankind has continued to follow. But in this, we we see two things. We see the remedy for sin, Christ, and we see also that consequences exist. Yeah, you have a comment, uh, Jeff? I think it was. Um, I forgot it now. (laughs) Sorry. Passed my mind. It's okay. (laughs) Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. So man has started down a path, but as soon as man starts down the path, 
the path, we have Christ promised that the seed of the woman would, would crush the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. And even Christ experiences the consequences of sin as a savior. Even though he never sinned, God actually has suffered because of sin. Sin has brought suffering to the heart of God. Moses understands it to some degree as a, he's a man, but he understands the heart of God. He understands the love that God has. So you see two things being illustrated, both the mercy and the justice of God. Those two things go hand in hand. Can you have mercy without justice? They're inseparable. Yeah, you can't, you can't have justice without mercy either. Because both, when they're on their own, mercy becomes license and justice becomes tyranny. The two have to be married together. They exist in God. And, and the word that we give it is love. Because love is both merciful and just. So the illustration that's here um, of the cross and of the Sunday law, there's so many things tied up in this story of the golden calf that we, have, we haven't even begun to plumb the depths of what's in this chapter. We've scratched on the surface a little, as we always do in our studies. But there is a lesson to learn in a very practical sense that, that God is showing us at the present time. That we are in great danger at the very time that God is wanting to make a covenant with this people. Do we agree with that? Uh, yes. Okay. And, you know, when we look at ourselves, all we see is failure. We know that we are not any better than anyone else. That we're sinners. We're, and we know that we can't trust in ourselves in order to accomplish whatever it is that God wants to accomplish. We hardly even know and understand what it is God wants to do. Um, you know, on my uh, academia site, I have, and, and on my YouTube page, I have, on my YouTube page, I have a sermon entitled Love, Part One. And on my academia site, I have the, the two sermons. The, the second sermon, somehow I lost it. I think it was on one hard drive that got wrecked. Um, but um, in those sermons, I present uh, something that I didn't fully understand at the time. I was just um, trying to understand. But I think it came across pretty well of how the gospel works, how God is operating what love is, but it's not this sentiment that people imagine it to be. Um, and at least for, for my thinking, it for me personally and understanding it, is that the one thing that I came to understand is that God is love and his whole nature, everything that he has ever done is an expression of his love, both in his judgments against sin and sinners, and also in his mercy. And that we judge God, even though we are unlike him, we judge him by our standard. And God is not like us. We're not like God. And the whole point of the gospel is for us to understand and know God, to become like him. 
And to be like God is to be like Moses saying, blot my name out of the book. It's like Christ at the cross, thinking that he will not come up in the resurrection, that sin is so hateful to God that he will be eternally separated from his father. And yet he is willing to go through that experience of the cross, even if it means the loss of himself. Um, last, sab last Sabbath, we had a presentation. Um, and I'm not sure it's critical, but it was a presentation about... Hi, guys. Hi, Mark. So Hi, and I so terrible. Sorry, I am very super late. Okay, anyway, Mark, I'm we talking We start things over. Uh, how okay. you take catch up? Well, I'm just giving a summary of everything. So, oh, okay. So last Sabbath, there was a presentation about the physical sufferings of Christ. And so I'm not trying to be critical, but I am being critical not of a person, but of an idea. And the idea, the first time I ever heard of the physical sufferings of Christ being presented, um, there was something about it that I disliked, I found distasteful. I felt that it minimized the sufferings of Christ because Ellen White says that the physical pain was hardly felt. And why was that? Why was the physical pain of Christ hardly felt when he went through what he experienced in during the before the cross and during the cross? He was being separated from his father. Yeah, it was his mental anguish, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he experienced any physical sufferings, he had to be sustained by an angel because he was now bearing our sins. His father was separating himself from his son. And he would have died there in the garden if an angel had not sustained his life. When we, when we stoop to the lowness of looking at Christ's physical sufferings as if it has anything to do with what Christ was doing as our sin bearer. We, we minimize the cross. We're looking at things the way the world looks at things. We can endure physical suffering. Man can endure it. But the, what the 144,000 experience in the time of Jacob's trouble, Ellen White says that things usually are worse in anticipation than in reality but not so with that experience. There is nothing that can prepare us for what we're going to experience in that mental anguish when we think that we have done something that has misrepresented our father, when we think that we have some sin unconfessed. And it's not because we care about ourselves. We care, just like Moses, about God's character and reputation. We know that God has said, let him that is righteous be righteous still. And so we're not fearing for ourselves. We're not self-centered. Our concern is not for our reputation. Our concern is for God's reputation. To understand this, can only be understood by the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. The world cannot understand these things. And really, somehow, God is going to have to reach us and help us to see these things. Because right now, we see through a glass darkly. We need to see God face to face. We need a revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to understand his character. And it has to be fully manifest 
in humanity, just as it was in Christ. And I don't know how that's going to happen. When I look at myself, I don't see how it's possible. I was talking with uh, one of my guitar students last night. His name's Luke, and really nice young man. And, you know, we, we got on to this topic of perfection of character. And he just said, well, I don't think it's possible. But I said, well, you know, because he says, I've never seen it. And I said, neither have I. But God says that it's going to happen. So this is the thing. This is the purpose of the sanctuary. It's the restoration of the image of God in man. The counterfeit, where man is going to make God in his own image. And really, when man makes a cow to represent God, we just think of ourselves as animals. We think of God as an animal. God is not a created being. He is the creator. To understand this, you know, this, this, is our goal, this is our purpose, and we don't understand it. We don't know God because we sin. Anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you on the Sabbath evening, thanking you for your wonderful work in our lives. In spite of our nature, in spite of the choices and decisions we have made and the promises that we've made to you that we've been unable to keep, we come before you, Lord, asking that you can fulfill your promises in us. Not for our glory, your Lord, but for yours. That you can take sinful humanity and exalt him and lift him up In Christ, that the character of Christ will be seen upon your people. This is the miracle of the gospel. And we pray for each one. We know that we need a change in our lives, but that change cannot be based upon man's promises because all of our promises are ropes of sand. We need faith in you. We need to be anchored to that cord that connects us with you and with Christ. Help us, Lord, to learn the lessons that you are trying to teach us. Be with us throughout this Sabbath. And again, we pray for your people. And we ask this and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>